Well, the title of the message today is It's Time to Know the Time, and we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and in the old King James it says like a thief in the night. When it comes, the heavens will disappear with a horrific noise, and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze, and the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. Since all these things are to melt away in this manner, what sort of people must you be conducting your lives in holiness and godliness while waiting for and hastening to the coming day of God? Because of this day, the heavens will be burned up and dissolved, and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze. But according to his promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness truly resides. Therefore, and by the way, he uses the word therefore, linking things, it links. Uh, it's, you know, they always tell us that there, the word therefore is there for a reason. So he says, therefore, dear friends, since you're awaiting for these things, Strive to be found at peace without spot or blemish when you come into his presence. And regard the patience for our Lord as salvation, just as also our dear brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, speaking of these things in all his letters. Some things in these letters are hard to understand, things the ignorant and unable twist to their own destruction, as they also do to, to the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard that you do not get led astray by the error of these unprincipled men and fall from your firm grasp of the truth, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the honor both now and on that eternal day. Well, I want to begin with the terrifying truth that I see in verse number 10. And uh, Peter spoke about the day of the Lord, and he said it will come like a thief, and like a thief in the night. And when it comes, he said the heavens will disappear with a horrific noise. You know, and in, in class we talked a little bit about the history and, the, and uh, the atomic bombs that were dropped during World War II and what a horrific sight and sound that was. Uh, I talked to some guys who were on Navy ships and watched those explosions from a distance. They gave them glasses to wear, uh, so their eyes wouldn't get burned, but they had no idea what type of radiation there was that would fall out. And later, a lot of those guys on that ship suffered from cancer due to that radiation explosion, uh, uh, exposure. But just a, just a horrific sound, Peter says, when it will happen. And the celestial bodies, the earth, the skies will melt away in a blaze, and the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. Well, when Christ returns in judgment, it will be a frightening day of disastrous consequences for anyone who has not repented of their sins and trusted Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. God's judgment is not going to be withheld forever. I mean, we look at the world today and we say, well, how in the world can people get away with that? Why doesn't God do something? Well, there's coming a day when God is going to do something. And when Peter mentions the day of the Lord, he is referring to a time in which uh, 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 God is going to deal with the wickedness of the earth in a manner that will be significant, severe, and very serious. John MacArthur said the Old Testament prophets saw the final day of the Lord as unequal darkness and damnation, a day when the Lord would act in a climactic way to vindicate his name, destroy his enemies, reveal his glory, establish his kingdom, and destroy the world. That is a future day. Today, I, I look at it as though we're living in a day and an age of grace where people are enjoying the unmerited favor of God through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. But in spite of the love of God, we still have people that are blaspheming the name of God, atheists who continue to deny the existence of God, and false teachers who continue to twist the meaning of Scripture for their own benefit. The day that Peter calls the day of the Lord is a day that is designated in the Scriptures. Much of the conversation is the Old Testament. I believe it will happen after the rapture of the saints or the, or the rapture of the church, as some people say it. It will be a time of God's wrath that he pour, pours out upon the earth and the unredeemed, the unsaved. 
He's going to judge this Christ-rejecting world. Now, if you read prophecy and you read into the, uh, what Paul says in First and Second Thessalonians and what unfolds in the book of Revelation, you can see this happening. And he speaks about that future event and in the end when God refashions, destroys this earth and creates a new heaven and a new earth. And then I think about the purifying target in verse number 11. Peter says, in view of all these things, we ought to have a goal or we ought to have a target. He says, since all these things are to melt away, in this manner, what sort of people must you be conducting your lives in holiness and godliness? Now, the word conducting is a word that means the way of life or your deportment, the way that you live your life. And Peter used this in 1 Peter 1.15 in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 and 12, listen as I read it. Like the Holy One who called you, become holy, yourse holy yourselves in all your conduct. Then in 1 Peter 2, he said, I urge you to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul and maintain good conduct among the non-Christians so that though they now malign you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and, deeds and glorify God when he appears. So he's saying that we need to have the right type of conduct as we see these things in the future. He's saying, you know, if you see this is coming, it's a sign that, 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 that things are about to happen and you need to get your lives right with God. To keep away from the fleshly lust which war against the soul is, rever is referring to any strong desires that is insist inconsistent with God's will as revealed in God's word. Simply stated, too much of the world and too little uh, uh, of God is detrimental to our spiritual well-being. You see, the day is coming, Peter is telling us, that Christ will turn, return in judgment to judge the unbelieving world. And what he is saying is, why waste your life on a world that is going to be wasted? I mean, God is going to destroy this world, and he's saying, why invest all of your life, all of your energies in a world and in things that will fade away and will be destroyed when we ought to be investing our lives in the things of God? And he spoke about godliness. I mentioned this earlier when we began this series. Godliness is an attitude of reverence and awe towards God. It's, it's giving God his rightful places in our lives, in our thoughts, and in our devotion to him. In 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 7, Peter said his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. And so it's not that we don't have what we need. We have the resources because God has already given us everything that we need. And if we will dedicate our lives and live our lives for him, he will, he will, he will strengthen us. Uh, and, and Peter went on to say that we need to add faith to goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. And when we add these things to our lives, when we grow in this way, we will have the conduct that Peter is calling us to embrace. Then I see a clarifying task in verse number 11. Peter spoke about waiting and hastening for the coming of the day or speeding the day of God. Now, and he said, because the day, because of this day, the heavens will be burned up and dissolve and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze. Now, that, the, the phrase, while waiting for, is a word that means to look expectantly for. To look expectantly for. And, and you've probably had that in your own lives when you were waiting for somebody to come, maybe for the family dinner, and you were looking expectantly for them to get here because they were bringing the main dish and you, nobody else could eat until they got here, okay? Peter used this word in chapter 3, verse 12, the, the chapter we're in. He uses it in verse 12, verse 13, and verse 14, that we are to be looking expectantly for this to happen, for Jesus to return, because it was prophesied in the Old Testament, and Jesus spoke about it as well. 
And, and so Peter is saying we should eagerly look in expectation for Christ's coming and the time uh, uh, of this to be fulfilled based on the promises of God. In Titus 2, 11 through 14, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this blessed age. While, he says, we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing and glory of great, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when Peter spoke about hastening, and, and I think the NIV will say speed, uh, the word is spudo, and it means to cause something to happen soon, to hurry something up, to make it happen. And, and so the idea is that if we live our lives the way that we are to live them and we're looking for the promise to be fulfilled, God will use us to reach other people uh, with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's not that we can change God's timetable, but it's that we can kind of speed it up or hasten it or help the lost get saved. And, and I mentioned this last Sunday, it's the idea of the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the way we were told to pray. We were to pray for God's kingdom to come on the earth. And in a sense, we hasten the return of Christ by living godly lives that point people to Jesus. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, Jesus said in himself, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Now, what does that mean? I mean, when will the end come? If you've got the answer to that, you're a whole lot smarter than I am. You know, I can remember back in the 1980s, and, and some of you are, are, are old enough to remember this, th it was during the Olympics, and some Muslim terrorists assassinated a bunch of the Israeli, the Jewish athletes in Germany. Somebody, somebody else, any of y'all remember that? Man, I worked on a sermon, and, and I, I, really, you know, I really thought the end time was so close, I might not even get to preach that sermon on that Sunday. Now, I wasn't going to be disappointed if I didn't get to preach it, but I really thought the end time was that close. But God doesn't give us a date. He says nobody knows the day or the hour. Jesus said only God knows that. And anybody who sets a date is lying. Because there is no date in the Bible. And God is not going to give any one human being special revelation that he didn't even give Jesus. But we need to live as though it could happen today. Peter preached that if people would repent, their sins would be forgiven, and God would send Jesus back from heaven. Listen, Acts chapter 3, verses 9 through 21. Peter said, repent, then and turn to God. And those are commands. Repent and turn to God. Why? So that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah. Now let me read it this way. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing will come from the Lord, so that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his prophets. Now, Peter didn't say, and this is the time it's going to happen, but he said, until the time comes. Then I see a verifying trust in verse number 13. Peter said, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness truly resides. I'm going to tell you, it, it hasn't happened yet because righteousness is not residing in the United States of America or other places around the world. So it hasn't happened yet. It's still future. Let me read a verse out of Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25. And notice the I wills. This is God speaking, a prophecy. I will create new heavens and a new earth. That's still future. The former things will not, re be, not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight to its people, 
and there is the city of Jerusalem that was proper during the time period this was written, but there is still put, looking forward to the new Jerusalem that it speaks about in the book of Revelation. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take the light of my people. Now I want you to listen. This is just precious. The sound of weeping. This is what happens when he comes and makes everything right. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought to be a mere child. The wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now notice that phrase, and dust will be the serpent's food. You know, it's, it's hard for me to preach one of these sermons like this because I have to keep winnowing it out or else we'd be here a long time speaking about everything that's in there. But I, I, I'm, I'm going to go just a minute or two longer here so I can give this to you. Now, I'm not going to be done in a minute or two. I'm just going to go a minute or two longer. You know, in the, in the book of Genesis, serpent, uh, the serpent is how Jesus is, or the, uh, the devil is portrayed. We get to the book of Revelation, he's portrayed as a dragon because he's increased in power. Now, when, when the serpent deceived Eve, and I know I've shared this with you before, but I, it's good enough I need to share it again. I don't believe he came up like a coiled rattlesnake shaking his tail and showing his fangs like he was going to strike Eve and bite her. I think at this point in God's creation, the serpent was a beautiful winged creature. I can't prove that, but when you get to heaven and you find out I'm right, it's a, Stan told me that back in August of 2023. But, uh, but, but I believe it was a beautiful winged creature who could fly because what greater judgment could it be on the serpent and God cursed the serpent than for a winged creature to have to crawl on the belly of his dust and the serpent's food would be dust. Now, I can't prove it, but I believe it with all my heart. And, uh, and, and, and this is what we've got to look forward to. There's going to uh, the Revelation says there's coming a time when there'll be no more sorrow, no more death, uh, no more pain, no more grief because the former things are passed away. Something else now, a fortifying tactic in verses 14 through 18. Peter says, therefore, dear friends, since you are waiting for these things, he's saying, I've been preaching to you about what the judgment is that's going to be future, about what's going to happen to Christians, what's going to happen for the lost. So while you are waiting on, uh, for these things to happen, don't just sit around and twiddle your thumbs. He said, instead, strive to be found at peace without spot or blemish when you come into his presence. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Now, remember what he said last week? The day, uh, day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So regard the patience of your Lord as salvation, just as also our dear brother Paul wrote, and then he spoke about how difficult some of Paul's theology could be to comprehend, and how he, the, the false teachers would take his teaching and twist it for their own good. And so he says, Dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard that you do not get led astray by the error of these unprincipled men and fall from your firm grasp on the truth. He didn't say fall away in your salvation, but he said fall from your firm grasp of the truth. Because if we lose our grasp of the truth, we, we stumble and fall away. And I'm going to tell you right here, and here I, I may have to add another minute to the sermon. But this is what the problem is in the United States today. I made this statement in, in the Sunday school class. We have worldviews in Washington, D.C. That, that are diametrically opposed to each other. And that is because of the way that we view truth. Now, I believe truth is absolute. Truth is not created, it is discovered. But we have people in Washington, D.C. that are trying to lead our country and saying, I don't care what truth is or what the facts is. It's the way I feel about it. Well, if we live our lives and run this country on just the way that we feel about it and based on our emotions, we are going down the tube. Because quite honestly, tomorrow morning, 
If we would not get out of bed until we felt like getting out of bed, there's a lot of people who'd spend all day in bed. Work wouldn't get done. The lawn wouldn't be mowed. The trees that have been blown over since last night wouldn't get cut up and hauled off. But truth is absolute. And that absolute truth is based on the word of God. And the farther our society gets away from what the Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, okay? The farther we move away from that, the farther we move away from God, and the quicker our nation goes down the tube. Uh, the psalmist said, righteousness is, exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we are not a righteous nation, and most of that is because we have turned our backs on the truth. Now, let's go ahead. That part was free. You won't get charged for it. <laughs> Verse number 14, okay? Now, Paul, Paul is saying here that we have these fortifying tactics, and I'm going to summarize them with, with three words. Be gazing is the first one. Okay, and so be gazing. Verse number 14, since you are waiting, and the Greek there is looking, it's the idea of looking, since you are looking for these things, since you're looking for Jesus to come for the Christians and the day of judgment to fall on the world, since you're looking for these things, strive to be found at peace without spot or blemish when you come into his presence. You see, when we have the right look, we live the right life. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, verses 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. He's saying our affections are in heaven now, because that's going to be our future home. And we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. That's at that rapture I mentioned earlier who will transform our lowly body that may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to him. Now, verse number 17 is be guarding. Be on your guard. Paul, uh, Peter said, you've been forewarned, so be on your guard. Folks, we cannot plead ignorance to the false philosophies of the world or the message of the false teachers and the false prophets We've been forewarned and the truth is in the Bible and we need to embrace it and take a stand. We need to be on guard, uh, guarding what our minds think, our eyes see, our ears hear, and what our hands do. We need to invest our lives in the things of God. Jesus said in Matthew, 16, uh, Matthew 6, do not store up for your treasures on earth, the earth that's going to be destroyed according to Peter, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths vermin, and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The truth of the matter, folks, is the measure of our lives is the treasure of our hearts. And we need to treasure the things of God. Then the, then the third one, verse 18, be growing. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how do we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus? The best way to look at it is to look at the example of the church in the book of Acts, right after Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, uh, uh, verse, I think it's verses uh, 24 to 47 and through there. Let me give you five things that they did. They were devoted to practicing the apostles' teaching. Second, they, they devoted themselves to fellowship with fellow believers. Third, they devoted themselves to worship by the breaking of, bre of bread, commemorating the Lord's death as in, in the Lord's Supper and worship. They devoted themselves to prayer. And then number five, they were devoted to evangelism. Every day, we're told, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And that is the task that we need to have is to encourage others to come to church so they can come to know Christ as their Savior as well. When the time in which we live, it's time for us to trust God. We need to trust his mercy. Psalm 116, 1 says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice and he heard my cry for mercy. We need to trust his salvation, Psalm 62, 1 through 2. Uh, my salvation comes from him. He's my rock and my salvation. 
We need to trust him for guidance. Psalm 25, 4 through 5. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. We need to trust him for his protection. Psalm 59, 9 through 10. You are my strength. I watch for you. You, God, are my fortress, my God, on whom I can trust. And the last thing, his promised return. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Would you bow with me in prayer? Well, Father, as we come now, I pray.